You know it. We know it. Next year is creeping up quick. If you want to win inside your niche in 2024, you need tech that puts you in the pilot seat. The new HubSpot Sales Hub will help you close out the year strong and kickstart your success for 2024. Teams can collaborate on every inch of the customer journey and keep operations running smoothly with a comprehensive prospecting workspace and powerful sales analytics tools that keep data connected across teams. They'll help you whip up assets and execute tasks that used to take hours out of your workday. HubSpot Sales Hub lets you accelerate every facet of your sales operation with precision. And with over 1,400 integrations, there are tons of ways to mix in new features. So finish out Q4 strong and gear up for the new year with HubSpot Sales Hub. Learn more at HubSpot.com slash sales. Howdy, folks. Good morning. It is Tuesday, July 25th. I'm Jacob Cohen here with Rob Litterst, and this is The Hustle Daily Show. On tap for today, Netflix can chill. The gap between them and the rest of the industry only feels to be widening, and we for one are done calling it the streaming wars. We'll get into all this in just a bit, but first, let's talk about what else is happening in the world of business and tech. Let's get crack leg. Okay, first things first to AI in AI. While AI is everywhere, AI companies are not. Of the 43 U.S. firms on Forbes' list of top AI companies, a whole 35 of them are headquartered in California. We're unsure if that means the Golden State will be the first or last to fall in the digital uprising, and I guess we will see. Speaking of Californians focused on AI, Sam Altman wants to scan your eyeball now. WorldCoin is his new financial identity tech startup, and it's now officially launched outside of the U.S. Where available, users can visit an orb, as it's known, basically an eye scanning device and gain a world ID meant to help verify one is human and not AI. Back to Altman's main hustle, though, OpenAI, ChatGPT will launch for Android next week, two months after its iOS launch, and users can pre-register via the Play Store now. On to something else, which actually you might be using right now. Spotify is increasing prices in several countries, with most plans bumping around $1 to $2. The company said the hikes are so that we can continue innovating, although they were probably thinking more along the lines of so that we can continue making money. (laughs) Also, everyone copies TikTok, but now TikTok is doing the copying, adding text posts a la X, the artist formerly known as Twitter, and threads, which copied X, the artist formerly known as Twitter. And last but not least, Adidas has made $563 million since May, selling off its Yeezy inventory. Last fall, Adidas cut ties with Ye, the artist formerly known as Kanye West, after the rapper's anti-Semitic remarks, but cool shoes beat morality, apparently, Yeezy demand was so high, Adidas couldn't fulfill all orders. With that, let's get on to today's main story. All right, JC. So you and I specifically on this podcast, I think, have talked at length about the streaming wars, but I think it's about time we can actually stop calling it the streaming wars. (laughs) think you're right. And I mean, it's always felt a little bit weird referring to competition between internet TV companies as wars. Other industries also compete, but you don't hear about the burger brawls or coffee conflicts like the classic Curb Your Enthusiasm episodes. True. After last week, it's pretty clear that it's not really much of a war between streamers anymore in the first place. Netflix has clearly emerged and has kind of always been the leader in streaming. Despite some rocky times over the last few years, it seems like they are in a really, really solid position to retain their crown for the long term. JC, we were talking about this earlier. They've made some big and somewhat controversial moves lately to bolster their position. What's going on here? What have they been up to? Yeah, so the biggest things this year were the launch of the ad-supported tier and really kicking off their password-sharing crackdown both opening up just huge opportunities and markets that were previously kind of closed to them by choice. And these are also both important to note, shifts in strategy. Totally. You know, they used to promise that they'd never have an ad supported tier or ads on Netflix. They used to tweet about how password sharing was caring, and now they're cracking down on it and charging more to do so. 
So both of those are still in the early days, but because of them, the company's profitability and subscriber growth are really accelerating as their competitors continue to just struggle a lot. You know, one thing I thought was particularly interesting in Netflix's latest shareholder letter was that they barely even mentioned their alternative growth narrative that they have been plugging for a long time now. Gaming. Exactly. Yes. And, you know, the last few years, that was kind of the next frontier of Netflix. And it probably still is in some ways. But, you know, they didn't even feel the need to mention those things because they're doing so well on all the other fronts. They're kind of like, let's just save it in our back pocket for when we need it. The other streamers in comparison from Disney to Warner Brothers Discovery to Paramount to Comcast are really just trying to keep up with Netflix, whose stock performance is just leaving them all in the dust. And these competing platforms are now having to raise prices as well as cut content to help drive profitability, which is a necessary move, but a really questionable growth strategy at that. Right. It's an interesting time to see this whole thing go down. I've always been kind of skeptical of Netflix's play in gaming One argument that I've seen and thought about with Netflix is related to what you just said. So I think it's Ben Thompson from Stratechery that said that Netflix would end up winning because they can spread their content development costs over more subscribers than any of their competitors. And so it'll be easier for them to develop content, Mm -hmm. harder for their competitors relative to Netflix to develop content. And once those economics run out for their competitors, Netflix will end up basically just licensing all of their content and become kind of like the everything store for streaming, right? They'll essentially become kind of like the Amazon of streaming that has everything that you would ever want, probably except for Disney, because I I doubt Disney would ever license it unless economics were really nice. But looking at Netflix's recent plays and how hard this has been for the rest of the industry, I think that thesis has legs and is kind of like the most likely scenario on how this plays out. And at the end of the day, like looking at the other players in streaming, besides niche streaming platforms for sports like NBA TV right. or like Shudder, which is a horror movie lover streaming channel. Or I know there's an anime one as well. Like besides those sorts of like really, really hyper specific streaming platforms, some of these more generalist streamers, like you mentioned Paramount and Discovery. Yeah. I just ultimately see them eventually licensing their content to Netflix or someone else. Well, yeah, I think you're right. I think we're going to see a, a lot more consolidation in this space, I think we're going to see big players in this space sell yeah. or merge. You could see players like Paramount sell to a Disney or sell to an Apple or something like that. Because I just don't see, like you said, how they're going to be able to manage and continue to keep up while they're continually losing money. Right. I mean, the other wrinkle that we haven't even talked about yet is what's going on in Hollywood right now. And yes. I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on whether or not this strike is going to have a big impact on what ends up happening with the streaming wars. Yeah, it's, it is interesting. And to your point, you know, you mentioned sports before. I do think one advantage that some of the more legacy platforms still have are sports, existing contracts, in some cases, decade-long contracts that Netflix has not really moved into meaningfully yet. But sports is a live thing. And like you said, Hollywood on strike right now, a lot of new TV shows that are not live and that are supposed to go on TV later this year or next year are not being filmed. And Netflix happens to be in a ironically almost really good position here because they have really robust overseas operations. They have a large stash of pre-produced content. They also have no reliance on linear TV networks. And so they've just positioned themselves to really weather these Hollywood strikes well, which they are, of course, blamed in part for causing (laughs) these Hollywood strikes in the first place. So it is an interesting time. And, And not just that, but they've perhaps even positioned themselves to benefit from these strikes to the tune of one and a half billion dollars in production cost savings this year. So it's really just remarkable how much this company has going for it now. And just the gap that to me seems to just be continuously widening between them and the rest of the industry. I started thinking about like, what is every streaming platform's value prop? You have those like super niche streamers that we were talking about before, like Shudder, but like those aren't going to scale, right? Like those are only going to grow to a certain size and it's going to be for the super fans. Sure. But in a world where consolidation is definitely going to happen, I think it's pretty obvious. Like Netflix is going to end up being kind of like the one-stop shop for streaming when a lot of these folks putter out. 
And to end off, though, I want to leave everyone with some good news for moviegoers and the war against movie theater chain AMC's strategy to charge more for better seats. The company uh, announced it is dropping its plan to implement that strategy, which I think is for the best. And I think anyone who goes to the movies will appreciate. Couldn't agree more. That whole thing just never really made a ton of sense to me. And bada bing, bada boom, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in to The Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig. Our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter, which you should totally sign up for if you are not already. Hope you have an awesome Tuesday. Catch you right here tomorrow. Hey, I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Puri. My First Million features famous guests like Alice Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern, went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire, thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.